Hello everybody. For those of us who still consider a 997 Generation 911 the new one, it can be difficult to admit just how old some cars are. Case in point, this, the third generation Toyota MR2, known in some markets as the MR Spider or MRS, in others as the MR Roadster, and in a few, simply the MR mostly French-speaking ones. I hate to break it to you, but this car is now more than 20 years old, having been introduced at the very end of the 1990s. That 20-year mark is an important milestone, because it's at this point where we need to make our mind up whether this is going to be a future classic or simply another old Toyota. Let's discuss. I want to say a big thank you not just to Joe who's brought this car out but to all of the other MR2 owners who offered their cars for review. I think I got back to nearly everybody. If I didn't, sorry, but I will get back in touch with a few of you soon. I asked in a video of the Mark 1 MR2 if anybody had a Mark 2 or 3 they could bring me for review. I have on the channel driven all generations of MR2, but I felt like the Mark II and Mark III in particular were ones I really needed to revisit. It appears that the MR2 community is a very friendly and welcoming one because I was inundated with offers of cars to drive. When it came to the Mark III MR2, I was very keen to try first an example of an unmodified car. Many people have made quite significant changes to their Mark III's and we'll get onto that in a little bit. Before I'm actually able to assess whether those cars have been improved or not, I really needed to familiarise myself with the original. And that's what we have here. This is a 2001 car, so a pre-facelift. And this represents really your entry point into the third generation MR2. All three generations of Toyota's midship runabout have been quite distinct. You had the original origami styling thing which came in a number of different flavours, then for many it's the second generation W20 car that is most fondly remembered. And that's the one, in case you aren't familiar, that looks a little bit like a Ferrari, and is also the basis for many Ferrari replicas. The third generation car bears more than a passing resemblance for me to a Porsche Boxster. I am sure Toyota would tell you that's completely accidental. I'm not so convinced. Crucially though, for this generation of car, Toyota did what we would all agree is a brilliant thing. They made a pure driver-focused car, so all of the engineering went into trying to make this a light and fun thing. They certainly succeeded with the former because this weighs around 950 kilos. In terms of sports cars, only an Elise or Caterham are notably lighter and neither of those have anything approaching creature comforts. This is a car you can get in, drive, use like a normal car. This one doesn't have air conditioning, but you could get it. The roof, though manual, is far easier to operate than that in the Elise. It's much like an MX-5, grab a lever, lift, two latches and you're done. It has a proper interior with carpets and little bits of leather and things like that. A very nice gear lever here, which is quite 1990s, much like the Storks, but then this is, technically speaking, a 1990s car. In terms of model years, these were available from 2000 until 2007, though they were discontinued in around 2005 for the US market. Air conditioning was actually standard with these cars if you got them with the optional hard top which to me actually is completely pointless on a convertible, but if it's your only car, like it is for Joe, that is something some people would consider desirable. He, like me, believes that if it's any warmer than five degrees and it's not raining, you should have the roof down. Good lad. He is a student currently in his final year, he is 24 years of age, and to insure this car is 280 pounds a year. That is amazing. Yes, his parents are on the policy, but then they are for everybody under 25. That's just normal. I was genuinely amazed when he said how cheap this car was to insure. That is certainly going to be a bonus. The turning circle is freakishly good. That's ridiculous. Normally I have to do a three-pointer there, which is kind of part of the test, but sod that. That's brilliant. 
And in more good news, the car can easily achieve close to 40 mpg, possibly even better on a run. Combine that with a 55 litre tank and it actually makes a pretty good cruiser too. All good news then, I'm sure you'll agree. Why then is the third generation MR2 not remembered particularly fondly? We'll discuss that after a bit of fun. And fun, the car definitely is. The steering is light but talkative. The chassis, rather playful. The brakes, excellent. This car is currently sat on some very old and cheap tyres at the front, which Joe knows need replacing. The fronts are eight-year-old matter doors, which are already cracking in a rather worrying way. For that reason, on these damper sections of road, I'm taking things just a little easier. The gearbox is also brilliant. In these early cars, it's a five-speed. In the latest, it's a six. The throw is short. The action very pleasing. I like it. But I am skirting around those problems, aren't I? Let's deal with them, shall we? Number one, the engine. Previous generations of MR2 had quite a range of power plants to choose from, including a supercharged option for the Mark 1 and a turbo for the Mark 2, although those weren't always available in all territories. However, for the third generation car, there was no choice at all. This car was only ever offered from factory with one engine. A 1.8 litre naturally aspirated four-cylinder Toyota unit dubbed the 1ZZ FED. It makes 143 horsepower and about 171 newton meters of torque. That's about 126 pound foot or thereabouts. The official 0 to 62 time in this car was just shy of eight seconds. That wasn't very good when it was new, and it's certainly not very impressive now, particularly for a car which purported to be reasonably sporty. Top speed was around 130 mile an hour, but that never has been all that important. As a base engine, this is excellent. It's got a good spread of torque. It makes a decent noise. This car, yes, is still on the standard exhaust, but even so, I quite like it. The thing is, I just don't understand why Toyota said, yep, yeah, that'll do, there's your lineup, done. That's madness particularly when you consider the company already had several engines which would have been a perfect match for this car, including the 2ZZ GE that you saw in things like the Lotus Elise. You may know that engine better from the Toyota Celica 190. That power plant has a very different character to this one. I would say at lower RPM, this is actually superior, but if you persevere and take the 2ZZ to its 6,000 RPM crossover, the rush from there to the 8,000 RPM red line is sensational. It's a wonderfully addictive, very different kind of engine. I would say even more aggressive perhaps than some of Honda's VTEC lumps. It's a really very different kind of engine which wouldn't have appealed to everybody, but would have appealed to some. More extreme types have even fitted a V6 to these. I actually drove one so equipped. With popular choices being the three or three and a half litre engine commonly seen in the Camry and also the Lotus Evora. That I think may have been a step too far for a production car, but the fact Toyota never offered anything spicier than this, I think was a big mistake. Even with mid-range tyres on the back, water on the ground and a fairly hefty dab of throttle, the rear end in this simply will not let go. The front I haven't got quite so much confidence in, but I'm putting that down to the tyres. The feel through the wheel and the chassis is absolutely delightful. It's one of the sweetest handling modern cars I've ever experienced, and actually really does remind me of the first generation MR2. That sense of just lightness, delicacy, really does come through the wheel. This is not a car that enjoys being grabbed by the scruff of the neck. Instead, you just gently guide it, scalpel-like through the bends, and it will reward with the most delicious feedback. So that was problem number one. What about problem number two? That's storage space, because there isn't really very much. Up front, where you'd expect to find a pretty healthy boot, you have what I can only describe as a small locker for your things. Beneath some very prominent midship runabout branding, you've got a very, very odd P2 
pyramid shaped kind of storage bin that I'm not really sure Toyota thought through. It's made even worse by the fact there is actually a spare wheel up there, which is where it should be, and that robs you of valuable space. Though I'm sure many would have a temptation to simply take that out and have a can of squirty cream on standby, Joe has had a puncture in this car before, and for that reason he does want to keep the spare on board. I think that's understandable. There is storage behind you, more than you might expect, but it's also awkward to get to, an odd shape and just not really very intuitive. There is also some stuff up front, you've got the glass box where you'd expect it and a little bit of extra storage just here in the center of the dash. So those are I think the two reasons people simply didn't give this car the time it perhaps deserved. For those and other reasons I'm sure these cars were awfully cheap for a very long time, often commanding less money than an MX-5 which in some cases was more than 10 years this car's senior. I have however noticed the prices are now finally on the up, with entry level examples costing around £2,000 and the very best between 7 and 10 The million dollar question then, is the third generation Toyota MR2 a car worth buying? I happen to think, yes it is, and buy it now! No, the engine isn't particularly fiery, but there are lots of solutions to get more power if you really, really need it. The chassis isn't the stiffest in these early cars. When they were facelifted in 2002, they got a little bit of extra bracing, and then I believe a little bit more in around 2005. For that reason, if things like scuttle shake bother you, and this car does have some, buy a later one. The steering though, even in this example, with its weak front tyres on, is delicious. The last example that I drove, I said, probably didn't handle as good as a Mark II, and that I think was probably an error on my part. There are many reasons why that may have been a true statement for that particular car, but as a model, this has a real delicacy and lightness about it that the second gen, I don't think does. Those are, after all, a couple of hundred kilos heavier than these. These are also comfortable. This has the regular suspension and original 15-inch tyres on. It's delightful. You could very easily drive this car every single day without anywhere close to the compromise that an Elise would ask of you. Maintenance is also very reasonable despite the car being mid-engined. The last full service this had cost £70. That even included spark plugs. Tyres of course will be cheap and as mentioned fuel economy is also very good. That's not to say it's a perfect car though, because it does have some faults. The roofs are known to go over time, the glass at the back can wear and you cannot replace it independently of the rest. This one has a new mohair roof on it and that cost about £600. The handbrake cable also needed replacing and I'm told that's also a common issue and that involves a lot of work, so I budget at least a couple hundred quid for that. The big one though is the engine. These are known for the catalytic converters, specifically the pre-cats breaking up, being dragged back into the engine and destroying it, much like you'll find in a Lamborghini Gallardo or a Ferrari F430. However, I have been told that the pre-cat failing is actually a symptom of another problem rather than a cause. These cars, with the early engine, the pre-facelift ones, have an issue with the bores going oval. When that happens, oil starts to get past, the oil gets into the pre-cats, that's what causes them to break up, and then that breaks the rest of the engine. So I suppose there is some truth to say the pre-cats are what cause the engine to fail, but the pre-cats don't simply fail on their own. When the cars were facelifted in 2002, I am told Toyota more or less solved this problem, so if you're worried about that, buy a later car. This car, being an early one, is burning some oil, but it's on 104,000 miles. And, should the worst happen and a replacement engine be required, they are apparently available at a very reasonable cost on an exchange basis. Around £1,200 is what I was told, and that is cheap for a new engine. I've no doubt to some that would be a deal breaker, but on the upside, if that does happen to you, I'm pretty certain you'd be able to get much of your money back when you do come to sell the car.
As for the rest of it, visibility is good, certainly with the roof down anyway. The controls are all nice and light. The car does have power steering, though it doesn't really feel like it needs it. For many people, neither the storage or engine will actually be that big a problem. And these don't even suffer from rust quite as bad as some of their Japanese contemporaries, though they do still suffer from it. Wind noise in the cabin on the motorway isn't even that bad. I'm currently doing the speed limit, 70 mile an hour, and I'm pretty sure you can hear me just fine. Is this the finest example of an MR2 Mark III out there? Certainly not. But is it a bad car? Definitely not. This is a fine way to get from A to B. A great car that I hope Joe is rightly proud of and I am very glad to have revisited. I look forward to filming more MR2s of all generations in the near future. But from now, I want to say a big thanks to Joe for bringing his car out, to you for watching. As ever, don't forget to like, comment down below, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.